The rest of us can turn over in our Bibles to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. As we get into the 18th chapter of Acts, we find that Paul has arrived at Corinth. He's left Silas and Timothy in Macedonia. They're going to go back and, and check on some of the churches that they've established and, and uh, just see how things are going. And then the city of Corinth was advantageously situated on an isthmus that connected the Peloponnesus with uh, Attica. And so it served as the capital city of Achaia. And so it had two important ports, uh, Latian and uh, Sintri. These two ports were the commerce centers for both the Ionian and Aegean seas, making it the chief market city between Asia and Italy. In Paul's day, the population is estimated to have been around 400,000. It was a, a city larger than Athens, and I was kind of surprised to learn that. Uh, because of its location and being a hub for commerce uh, throughout the region, the people would have been quite diverse. There would have been Jews, Greeks, uh, uh, Italians, as well as who knows who all were in there. But Corinth was known for many things, some of it evil and some of it good. Uh, they were known for their bronze work. In the third chapter of Acts, maybe you'll recall where we read about uh, the lame man who'd been lame from birth, and he laid him uh, daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. This gate was called Beautiful because it was beautiful. Pretty creative, isn't it? The temple had nine gates. And these nine gates were covered with gold and silver and pretty ornate and all that. But this gate, out of bronze from Corinth, was considered to be beautiful. So it had to be something very, very special. Corinth was a corrupt city. It was as evil as it could be as men and women looked to satisfy the desires of their flesh continually. They were the partying crowd. Religion itself was put to uh, carnal use. A magnificent temple stood there dedicated to Aphrodite, and in the temple were a thousand priestesses that, air quote, ministered to the godless men of the city. These priestesses were actually prostitutes. The Corinthians had taken fornication and adultery, and they had woven it into their religious practices. The morals of Corinth were so bad that the name of the city itself was used as a derogatory uh, term to identify those who were immoral. Uh, they would refer to these people as Corinthians, not because necessarily they were from Corinth, but because they were immoral and they lived uh, a, a uh, uh, lascivious and, and uh, uh, just a wicked life. So uh, you can kind of get the idea how bad the city must have been. Paul's second missionary journey is coming to a close. His trip had been uh, arduous. He had suffered along the way. Paul knew what it was like to have been beaten, to be imprisoned, uh, to be lied about, to be rejected by those that he cared for. And I assume that Paul could have quit somewhere along the way, but he didn't quit. He, he pressed on. When Paul would, would run into opposition, he just trusted in the Lord and, and he would uh, kind of uh, ride the wave through and come out on the other side uh, prepared to continue to preach the gospel. Paul was fully committed to share the gospel with the lost and dying of the world. Paul would later write uh, to the Corinthians and provide a little insight what drove him so hard to preach the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9.19 he said, For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Paul was a free man, under no obligation to anyone to conduct himself as he did. Paul voluntarily went about his ministry as a slave would work for their master. Paul didn't minister as a way to make a living. In fact, Paul was bivocational. He was a tent maker. And uh, to earn his keep, he, he would, uh, when he would go into a town, he would set up shop, so to speak, and, and he would ply his trade in order to provide for himself as well as his team. I believe that Paul's commitment to the ministry was driven by his salvation experience. Paul had been a Jew, a zealous Jew, and he had a passion for Judaism. And he had such passion that he began when, when the way, is what Christians were referred to uh, early on, when the way came into being, uh, Paul began to persecute the church. He wanted to eradicate the name of Jesus Christ. But as he 
was making his way to Damascus with a letter in hand, a letter of introduction, a letter that would allow him to imprison uh, Christians and uh, knowing full well that when he got to prison, most likely uh, some of them for sure were going to be put to death. I think that the change that Paul had experienced on the road to Damascus when the Lord uh, struck him blind and, and he went in and began to, uh, to pray and to understand that what he was and what he was now. That there was such a change, such a miraculous change that Paul felt uh, fully committed to the fact that I need other people to experience this. Uh, I've already experienced that this morning. As I said, I'm standing over there, you all are singing. I'm just thinking, man, the, the spirit is so good. And I want everybody to be able to experience that. You know, listen, there's people that are standing in church right now and they're nervous. They're nervous because they're not right with the Lord. Uh, they're not uh, experienced that same joy and peace that uh, we as believers experience because they've been at war with God. And they haven't settled that war. They haven't come to peace with him. If only we could take our salvation experience and turn that into the same type of motivation that the Apostle Paul had. Paul felt obligated. He felt obligated to tell that uh, unbeliever, to tell that lost person about Jesus Christ, to tell them about salvation, to tell them about eternal life. And uh, he, when he said that he was a prisoner or a slave or a servant to all men, what he was saying is, is that uh, I am so compelled by what I have experienced, I want everybody else to share the same thing. And you and I today, if you're here as a true born again believer in Jesus Christ, if you've been washed by the blood, uh, you know what it is to have passed from death unto life and a life lived through Jesus Christ, then you know what I'm talking about. You've experienced something and you want to go and you want to tell your lost uh, uh, spouse or your children or your grandchildren or your neighbor and say, I got something for you. You know, listen to this. Uh, I, I kind of think sometimes, you know, somebody will buy something new, a, a car or some product or something, and, and, and it's just the greatest things in sliced bread. And so they get excited about it and they want their neighbor to know, hey, man, you, you got to go buy this, you know, this Chevy or Ford or whatever. I don't want to start a debate here. But, uh, <laughs> but you got to have one like this. I remember as a kid, you know, my dad used to pick on people that, that would uh, own Dodges. He had a buddy that they would go back and forth all the time. But we want to be able to, to say, hey, this is, this is something good, and you need it. You need it. Well, let me tell you something. Salvation is something good, yes. and you need it. Amen. And you need it. Amen? That's right. So uh, it should be incumbent upon us to want to share the gospel with those who don't. So Paul is coming from Athens. Athens was a religious city. Remember we talked about uh, how that there were so many idols in there and what have you. And so he's... Uh, He's been in Athens, he's coming to Corinth, and so he's continuing his second missionary journey into a sin-filled city of Corinth. Corinth was not the kind of place that a believer would want to go and hang out, but it is the kind of place that a believer would want to go in to tell them about Jesus. Paul's second missionary journey is said to have taken somewhere uh, between 49 uh, A.D. to 52 A.D. Paul's trip had been a long and dangerous, and he had suffered greatly along the way, and now he was faced with entering a godless city like Corinth. Who would know what would befall him? Paul went anyway. His love for the Lord and his passion for people, lost uh, people, people dying and going to hell, compelled him to go, no matter what the personal cost might be. He was compelled. Listen, if you're going to tell someone about Jesus, if that's going to be your habit in life, and you're going to make the effort to go that, let me just uh, tell you the fact. The fact is, there's going to be some people you're going to tell them about Jesus, and they're going to be like, I don't want to hear about Jesus. And they're going to distance themselves from you. They don't want to be around a Jesus freak. They don't want to be around someone that's always talking about salvation and hell and heaven and all these things. They don't want to hear it. But you know what? We have been called to plant the seed. We Listen. I think sometimes we don't witness because we think that the situation is, is so dire that this person will never give their heart to the Lord. And so I think sometimes we don't say anything. That's not our responsibility to decide. Our responsibility is to plant the seed, to water it, to do all we can to uh, help it to grow and to, to manifest itself into a harvest. And, but God is the God of the harvest. We are responsible for planting and preparing uh, for the seed to be planted. So uh, don't back down on, on those opportunities. So this morning I want to preach a message. I've titled it, uh, Paul's Passion for People. Paul's Passion for People. So if you would stand with me, we're going to read a few verses here in chapter 18.
beginning in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, a born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was uh, pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Let us pray. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you, uh, Lord, for uh, your word and for the things that we can uh, learn and be encouraged uh, uh, by it, and Lord, and to instill boldness uh, uh, and, and courage amongst uh, our people. Lord, as Paul is witnessing in, in a, an evil city, uh, we know that uh, we're faced with evil city uh, in this world today. Lord, the, the condition of the world is, is just terrible, and uh, we need to be able to be steadfast in our willingness to share Christ with others. Lord, so that they might know the peace and the joy that comes with salvation through Jesus Christ. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. Baby, seated. So in Athens, Paul found that the people there were very religious. In fact, they were so religious that archaeologists today say that there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 33,000 idols. 33,000. They actually had a, a God that they called the unknown God because they had a God for everything. But just in case they left something out, as we discussed last week, they had this unknown God. Well, Paul, as he's waiting on uh, Silas and Timothy uh, to show up, he's walking through the city and he's becoming overwhelmed by the, all these, uh, these idols. And so he wants to introduce the Athenians to uh, the great I am, the true and the living God. He's saying, I'm going to tell you who the unknown God is, and it's this one. So Paul has gone from that uh, uh, city, which I think uh, personally that Athens had to be one of the greatest challenges that Paul faced because all those people thought that they were, they were good to go because they were godly people. They had all these gods to worship, and so they considered themselves religious, and they didn't need uh, salvation and things like that. Well, Corinth isn't like Athens. So, yeah, they had their idol worship, they had their temple prostitutes, but what these people were, uh, they were very sinful, and their way of life uh, validated that. Corinth would have been like Hollywood or Las Vegas as far as conduct was concerned. We read in verse 2 that upon his arrival in Corinth, Paul met Aquila and his wife Priscilla, a Jewish couple that had been banished from Italy according to an order issued by Claudius. Evidently, it had happened a few times during the Roman Empire that uh, the spirit of anti-Semitism had risen up. And when it would, oftentimes Jews would be banished from uh, either the region or a city or whatever. And so having been banished, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, they fled to Corinth, and it's there where they're going to meet Paul. Now, once they arrived there, Aquila and Priscilla, they went to work in their trade as tent makers. So they set up shop and, and probably, you know, getting things organized. And when Paul arrives in the city... Being a tent maker, he's probably looking for some place to work. He's looking for some place to set up. And so he meets Priscilla and Aquila. Now, in Paul's day, all Jewish men taught their sons a, a trade, especially so if they were a rabbi. The, the work ethic that Paul would have had would have been, would have been extreme. Um, there were times, you know, as Paul went through, I mentioned he's bivocational. So Paul, as he would go into a town, he would build, make his tents, raise money and earn for him and for his team. But then there were some times where the churches would, would give to him and where he'd be able to focus fully on the ministry. But Paul had a deeply rooted work ethic, and it helps us to understand what his personality would have been uh, in regard to the ministry and his commitment to do the work and get it done. Paul makes his feelings clear when in his letter to 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he said this, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Ouch. Ouch. Can you imagine standing up on a, on a pedestal somewhere here in this country and telling people, if you don't work, you don't get to eat? That wouldn't fly today, would it? That would upset people terribly. Hey, but the Lord say, hey, this is the Lord's word, not mine. You know, I just happen to agree with it. If you're too lazy, too unwilling uh, to work, 
then you shouldn't be eating. You know, I think that the need to eat is a good motivator for someone to go to work, you know. And some of us have been working a lot, and I'll just leave it at that. So Aquila and Priscilla, they were believers. Now, whether or not they had become Christians prior to meeting Paul, I'm not sure. But Scripture teaches that they left with him when he would leave Corinth and go to Ephesus. Upon arriving in Corinth, Paul did what he always did. He reasoned uh, in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So every Sabbath day, Paul was in the synagogue teaching about Jesus. Why wasn't Paul in the synagogue every day teaching about Jesus? You know why? He was at work. That's exactly right. He was at work. So Paul did for uh, a living, and throughout the week, you know, he, he was making tents. So perhaps you're wondering, how in the world did Paul uh, get the ability to preach to Greeks if he's preaching inside the synagogue? Well, there was an area in, in the back side there somewhere where uh, you had the God fears. You remember a few weeks back we talked about God fears. God fears were uh, Jewish proselytes, people that had converted to Judaism, Gentiles who had converted, but they had not yet become circumcised. And so they also there were certain laws that they weren't required to follow because they hadn't uh, fully uh, committed themselves through the act of circumcision. So there would have been this group over there, this group of Greeks that uh, Paul would have been able to preach to and to share the message. So as we... As we read that when Silas and Timothy arrived in Corinth from Macedonia, it says that Paul was pressed in the spirit. When Paul's teammates arrived in Corinth, it appears that Paul was uh, invigorated. There's something, listen to me, there's something encouraging about you being here this morning. You need to know that. You're an encouragement to me for sure. But there's other people in the congregation that are going, well, where's so-and-so? Why aren't they here? And their mind begins to wonder. Now they're not listening to me. And I probably just turned you on to that thought. Now you're wondering where your friends are, right? <laughs> but he was pressed in the spirit. He was encouraged. It's encouraging. Listen, I always tell you, you shouldn't minister alone. Grab someone and go take them with you. Uh, if you're going to go door knocking or you're going to go visit someone who's sick or or something like that, grab someone and take them with you. Let them be your encouragement, or you be their encouragement, whatever the case may be. So not only was uh, their arrival encouraging to Paul, but they brought a gift. They brought a gift from the church at Philippi. They had uh, given him uh, money to take to Paul, so Paul would be able to focus more on the ministry. So Paul's message that Jesus was indeed the long-awaited Messiah was not necessarily well received by all Jews. We know that. That's been the pattern of everywhere he goes. He goes, he preaches Jesus Christ. There's some that believe, and there's many who do not. And when this particular group, when they decide that they're going to reject Paul's uh, message, they begin to blaspheme. Paul, it says that he shook his raiment. Shook his raiment. He's like, I'm done with you. Your blood's not on my head. I've told you about the Lord. I've told you about Jesus. I've told you about salvation. I'm done. Now you work it out with the Lord. He says, from this point forward, I'm going to pay attention to the Gentiles. And they'll receive the message at least better than uh, the Jews often did. So this statement that Paul makes that he's no longer going to be uh, coming into the synagogue to, to address the Jews, it's not a blanket statement. He's not saying from this point on he's only going to minister to Gentile. He's just saying to the Corinthians, I'm no longer coming back to this synagogue. I'm going to, I'm going to deal with the Gentiles. Because when, we get to, when he arrives in Ephesus, the first thing he does, he goes into the synagogue. So we know that this is focused on the Corinthians. I can't imagine Paul, um, excuse me, I can't imagine Paul how painful it must have been for him. Remember who Paul was. Paul was a, a devout, a zealous Jew. Uh, he was trained by one of the most respected rabbis, Gamaliel. And so he was a very uh, a dedita dedicated and committed uh, to his uh, religion, his uh, uh, Judaism. And so much so that he, when the, when the way arose and he was trying to eradicate the name of Jesus from off the face of the earth. And so I just can't imagine how hard it must have been for him to say that, I'm done with you. These were people that he loved simply because they were Jews. 
but I believe that he loved them in a little bit different manner today. Uh, I think that Paul loved them because he had been indwelt with the love of God. Have you been indwelt with the love of God? And let me tell you something. You know, the Bible's very clear that we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love the brethren. But it also, we're, we're taught that we're supposed to love, we're supposed to love all people. And that's not always easy to do. And oftentimes we don't do it, and then later we go, you know, I didn't show very much love on that per- particular person. And um, it's just one of those things. Despite Paul's being mistreated by them, uh, he still loved them. He was following uh, uh, what Jesus had taught over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. This is Jesus speaking. says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Wow. Wow. Is there anyone here that it's your nature? If someone begins to curse you, that you just grab them and hug them and say, oh, thank you for that? <laughs> Probably not. I know I don't. My first thought is, bring it on. But Jesus said, supposed to love them and so we we need to pay attention when people are being disagreeable the first thing we need to establish in our minds and in our hearts are are they lost are they lost and if they are lost then now's when i need to show them love because i'm supposed to be an extension of god's love having been filled with the holy spirit i should be able to be a good witness to this person even in in their worst of times and if they're a believer they're having a bad day. They're having a bad day, and they need to be loved anyway. So, you know, uh, it's not about getting even. It's not about, you know, but, you know, the thing is, and I told you, I think pride's, pride's behind 99.9% of all our sins. Someone talks to you uh, like that, someone's disrespectful to you, your pride begins to boil up, and you want to strike back. So loving them is not necessarily the first thought that we have, but it needs to be. It needs to be. Paul was the model Christian in applying the lessons that Jesus had left for them. Despite being mocked, being belittled, beaten, and imprisoned, Paul continued to love his Jewish brothers and sisters. In the seventh, cha- in the seventh verse, it says, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Now, Paul had been staying with uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and then for some reason he moves in with this, uh, this guy, Justice. Uh, maybe it's just a convenience that his, his uh, house was uh, connected to the, uh, uh, to the synagogue. And in verse 8 it says, In Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. The conversion of Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, it had to be a shock to the Orthodox Jew. As the chief ruler, Crispus would have been responsible to conduct all the assemblies, interpret the law, decide uh, matters among the Jews according to the law, and he would have been the one to excommunicate those who rebelled against the law. So he was a very powerful and influential person in the church. And so uh, here it is we read that he has given his heart to Jesus Christ. Now, we, we know later on in the text that uh, his, his position is taken over by uh, someone called Sosthenes, and uh, so he was chosen to be the chief ruler in the synagogue. In verse 9, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city." Evidently, Paul may have, maybe he was experiencing some discouragement. Maybe there was some frustration in there uh, by all the opposition that was going on. And you know what it's like if you're, you're involved in a disagreement with someone. It's hard to sleep sometimes. It's hard to, it's hard to clear your thoughts because you're, you're going through the, this debate in your mind about what was right, what was wrong, what was said, what wasn't said, all those things. And so evidently, Paul had some type of discouragement here through all this opposition. And so in the midst of his discouragement, Paul received a vision by the Lord, and he was told, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. The Lord assured Paul that he was with him, and no harm would come to him due to his preaching at Corinth. What an encouragement that had to be. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not calling this a, a vision or anything like that. 
But the other night, I had a dream. And you know how dreams are. They flash all around and all that good stuff and all that. But I was about at the third or fourth pew. I was walking down the aisle getting ready to go to the pulpit. And this place was full. And I saw, I saw a lot of familiar faces. And there were faces I, obviously, they were new. So I'm not telling you I had a vision, but I will tell you this. I woke up with a smile on my face. I woke up with a smile on my face because it's kind of like a reminder that, yeah, this is where we're going. This is where we're headed. People are going to give their hearts to the Lord. The church is going to grow. The church is going to have a good spirit. And I will say to you, that's our job, all right? We have got to, we got to be prayed up, studied up, and, and ready to love whoever walks through those doors. Because what I will tell you is whoever walks through those doors 99 times out of 100, they're hurting. They're hurting in some way or fashion. And they need someone to love them, someone to care for them, someone to take the time and listen to them. You know, sometimes just being there to listen is the best gift you can give someone. You know, men, we want to fix everything. I get so frustrated over things that are going wrong. I just want to grab them and fix them and all that. But some things you just can't grab hold of and fix. Some things are going to take time. They're going to take effort. They're going to take commitment and dedication. And you're just going to have to keep on, keep on, keep on. But that's who we have to be as, as children of the Lord. In verse 11 says, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Think about that. He's evidently experienced some discouragement. He's got all this opposition. He's got these people that eventually they're going to rise up and create an insurrection against him and all this other stuff. Uh, but Paul's so encouraged by this vision, he stays in another year and a half. Can you imagine sticking around a year and a half at a place that you know that you're not wanted? I don't want to spend 18 seconds in that place. You know, and here he is, 18 months, he's going to stick in there. He's going to share the Lord with them. But as is the case wherever he goes, eventually... The Jews, they begin to get uh, people stirred up. In verse 12, it says, And when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. So the Jews are deploying their familiar tactic. And we see it still today. You go in and you witness to people and what have you, and, and there's some that, uh, that will believe, and there's some that will agree with you, but there's always going to be opposition. If you haven't figured that out by now, let me just tell you the secret. There's going to be opposition to Jesus, all right? If they don't like Jesus, they're not going to like you too much. So as, as you begin, as Paul's preaching all the, they decide, so the ones that are unbelievers, they say they go over and they begin to stir people up. Can you believe this guy? He, you know, that's not what the law says. That's not what we practice. That's not how we do things. He said this and he said that. And listen to me. One of the most irresponsible things you can do as a believer or just as a human being is to let somebody approach you and whisper something negative about someone else in your ear and you buy into it without having investigated yourself, without you having been there to hear what was said, with you out not being there to witness what occurred. That is the most irresponsible. I know people that don't like people and they've never even met them. They just don't like what they've heard about them, but they don't know that person. And uh, so uh, what's going on here is the people are getting all stirred up. And so they take this group and they take Paul and they take him before the judgment seat, take him before uh, the, the governor, and uh, they begin to make all these accusations. And they're saying, well, he's doing things contrary to the law. Well, it looks like initially Galileo was saying, thinking Roman law, which would have been his business. If you're doing something against Roman law, hey, it's my business. But it says Paul was getting ready to defend himself. Paul was getting ready to say something. And Galileo, he began to speak. And he said, you know what? He said, hey, this, this ain't none of my business. This has nothing to do. No, this is your law, uh, your problem. You handle it. And so he kind of got him uh, cut off. But look, look how they respond here. 
Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes. Remember we said earlier Sosthenes was probably the one that replaced Crispus as the chief ruler of the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat and Galileo cared for none of these things. And well, let me tell you probably what I think probably happened was uh, Sosthenes being the chief ruler of the synagogue, he was probably the, uh, the uh, prosecutor. He probably is the one that took their case before uh, Galileo, and now these people are going to uh, beat him up pretty good because he failed to make a good enough argument to get Galileo to take action against Paul. So they beat him up. So they beat him up. And, and Galileo, you read here, Galileo wouldn't have anything to do with it. Now, if you read uh, a little bit, everything that I've read thus far about Galileo, it says that he was a very, he was a likable guy. He was, he was a, a gracious guy. And all these, uh, he, it sounds like he was a good, good dude. But he wasn't going to get into their business. You go handle it the way you see fit. And he didn't get drawn into their drama. So Sosthenes, uh, who replaced Crispus, uh, he evidently gets saved. Because Paul uh, mentions him in his writings to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. In verse 18, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence unto uh, Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head at Chantria, for he had a vow. So, So Galileo's ruling on the matter, or his decision to not rule on the matter, allowed uh, Paul to stay longer in Corinth. But this vow that they speak of, the vow spoken of here, uh, some, some scholars say it was talking about uh, Achilla, and, and some say it's, it's Paul, some say both. Uh, I personally think that it makes more sense if it's Paul who had the vow, and then a vow simply being a solemn, solemn promise made to God, and it could be about anything. But we're not told specifically, but it very well could have been a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow was a solemn promise made to God to separate oneself from the world and unto God. The Nazarite vow has five uh, parts to it. Number one, it's voluntary. Number two, both men and women could make the vow. Number three, the vow had a specific time frame. You know, from this date to this date, I'm committing wholly to the Lord. The fourth thing is that there was several restrictions. They weren't allowed to drink wine or any intoxicating drinks. They couldn't eat grapes. They couldn't eat the seeds of the grape. They couldn't have anything to do with something that could be fermented. They were not permitted to cut their hair during this time period. And they could not go near a dead body where they would be considered unclean. They couldn't even go into a house where a body had, had, had been. At the conclusion of the time period, they would present themselves to the priest, and the priest would, uh, there was a couple of sacrifices that the priest would make, and then uh, they would cut off their hair, and the priest would take the hair, and they would take it and burn it on the altar. And so that, that was the uh, makeup of the Nazarite vow. So uh, I think it's interesting that women would have taken that vow and, Shaved head and all that. So, but evidently Paul had made a vow. In verse 19, talking about Paul, and it says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there. So Paul has departed Corinth. He's getting back on his, on his journey now. And so he leaves um, Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. But he himself entered into the synagogue, and he's reasoning with the Jews, as he commonly does. When they desired him to tarry longer, with a uh, longer time with them, he consented not. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. When they arrived at Ephesus, Paul, uh, he kind of separated himself from Aquila and Priscilla. They're over there setting up their shop, getting things together, finding a place to live, all that good stuff. Paul goes into synagogue, and he begins to uh, preach about Jesus. Aquila and Priscilla, they remained in Ephesus for several years after this arrival. Paul sends them a greeting in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, and that's where he refers to a church that they were conducting in their home. So they had a home church there in Ephesus. They were ministering. So Paul, uh, when he writes the letter to Corinth, he says hi to them. And later, evidently, they did go back to Rome because in Paul's letter to the Romans in uh, 16, 3, 
Paul greets them in his letter to the Romans. So despite having those who desired him to stay, Paul would not. He told them that he would return if God will. Sometimes, and you hear some people say it, I'll see you tomorrow, Lord will. Or, yeah, we're going to go here, Lord will. Because we should always understand, you're not going anywhere, you're not doing anything unless God wills it. You know, uh, if, he, if he strikes you down with an illness or, or some catastrophe or something like that, you're not going anywhere. You know, we need to be mindful that we are subject to the will of God. So, uh, despite these people that the, these officials wanting him to stick around, he says, I can't. God will, I'll come back. Um, the feast of Jerusalem that Paul keeps uh, mentioning is probably the Passover. We're not told specifically. So he wants to get to Jerusalem to take part of this feast. And it should be noted that Paul was very determined to arrive at Jerusalem in time to celebrate the feast. As a born-again follower of Jesus, Paul no longer had any spiritual need or requirement to observe any of the feasts that the Jews celebrated. But there was also no reason to prevent him from celebrating it. Several years back when I was in, uh, in college, I didn't go to college until I was 37. Uh, I'm a slow beginner. Um, but one, I took a world religions class, and one of the things that they had us do, we had to go attend a religious service in a church or temple or synagogue, something other than free will Baptist for me. So uh, myself and Karen and a couple friends from school uh, went down and to the Greek Orthodox uh, Church in Melbourne. And so we got there probably around 9 o'clock. You know, we're, we're just guessing what time they started. So we walk in and church is already going on. And so we're standing in the lobby. We're trying to figure out, well, should we disturb them? Should we do this? We didn't know what to do. So finally somebody walked by and, and they said, yeah, go on in. You're okay. So we went in and we sat down. And now mind you, I have no idea how long they've been in church. We sat there for like an hour and a half. And they were still going strong. I don't, I don't think they even had gotten to the sermon yet, to be honest with you. I couldn't understand everything that was going on. But what I will say to you is, is at the end, uh, when we got up and we walked out and to leave, I did feel like I'd been in church. You know, obviously when they would share some of the scripture, I would understand what was being said and what all that. I didn't understand all the uh, activity that was happening. But it was an interesting experience and uh, certainly one that... Uh, I kind of opened my eyes up that, look, just because someone does something differently doesn't necessarily make it wrong. Now, I'm not saying it makes it right either. I'm saying well, what are we, we're supposed to try the spirits, right? And so I'm just saying that there's, uh, people do things differently. Uh, we've, we've kind of experienced it since uh, Tyler and Alex have been here. How many songs has Tyler brought to us that we'd never heard before? I was telling him the other day, I said, man, I never heard that song, but man, that's a great song, you know. And as he started this morning, that, that song he opened with, I thought, have I heard? And then we got out and said, yeah, I've heard that before. I really like that. So, you know, there's just kind of different things. We go around the country that people do a little bit differently. The way maybe they do uh, uh, the Lord's Supper or something like that. Uh, feet washing, all that good stuff. So in verse 22, it says, And when he had uh, landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order of strengthening all the disciples. So just to show you that when it says here that he landed at Caesarea, Caesarea is a, is a coastal town. And so a lower elevation. And when you read it, it said that, you know, prior to this, it says that he went, uh, yeah, there it is in verse 22, that he had gone up. He had gone up to Jerusalem. They don't mention Jerusalem specifically, but from Caesarea, if you're going to go up anywhere, you're going to Jerusalem. After you've arrived at Jerusalem, anywhere you go after that, you're going down. So this is how we know that he was at Jerusalem, uh, having uh, done that. So uh, arriving in, in Antioch, Antioch is Paul's home church, and that marks the end of his second missionary journey. In verse 23, it teaches us, it says, after he had spent some time there, he departed. We don't know how long he went, went home and rested. We just know that he was there for a little while, and he goes again. He's going to go back out, and he's going to go on his third uh, missionary journey. Paul's second missionary journey lasted somewhere between three and four years. He departed, uh, after this unknown amount of time, he departs for his third missionary journey. 
Paul's third missionary journey is a uh, uh, guesstimate between four and five years, uh, from 53 to 57 A.D. Paul began his missionary travels in 46 A.D., and he wouldn't complete them until his, uh, he got in, arrived in Rome as a prisoner in 60 A.D. He never really finishes, okay? I'm just, it's kind of a point where he gets in prison, and it's kind of a mark you can use. But Paul, while he was in prison, obviously wrote uh, his letters uh, to provide encouragement and direction. There's varying opinions about his fourth missionary journey. Some say that Paul did go on a fourth trip after he was released from prison in 64 AD. Others count his being transported from Caesarea to Rome as his fourth missionary journey because he did minister to people along the way. Regardless, it's easy for us to see the passion that Paul had for the people. You can hear his excitement and his love uh, for uh, these churches and his letters to them as he writes them and greets them. No one can deny Paul's passion for the lost. He spent all those years traveling. He spent all those years being threatened and being uh, uh, excommunicated and, and kicked out of the cities and stoned and imprisoned and shipwrecked and all these other things. Paul, Paul went through all that. And every time they'd knock him down, he'd get right back up. And he did it because he was so concerned for that person that didn't know Jesus as their Savior. He was willing to endure anything. The question comes and should be upon our own hearts. What are we willing to endure to see the gospel of Jesus Christ shared with the unbelieving? Sometimes we read, I know when I was younger, I just read the Bible. I didn't really dig into it too deep and all this other stuff. But when you begin to read and to dig and to really try to understand what's going on, try to understand Paul's personality, uh, uh, Paul was such a determined. I've often thought, you know, I've seen people that give their heart to the Lord and I know what they were as, a, as an unbeliever and how, uh, uh, how well they did sin. And I've often thought, I said, boy, if they, did, if they did salvation the way they did sin, we'd have something here. We'd have something here. Like Paul. Paul's the perfect example. Paul was, was very zealous. He, he, he is, in his own testimony, he talks about how he persecuted the church and, and uh, how he was just a witness to all these horrible things that was done to Christians. And he was good with that. But now when he gets saved, that same energy, that same drive, that same commitment goes into sharing Jesus. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell people about what Jesus Christ can do for you because I want them to know this peace and this joy that takes place. He was willing to endure anything. And I look around and I think about our country today. I think about uh, American Christians. And then, you know, I've only, the only place I've ever been outside the country was to Cuba in 2003. And boy, did that open my eyes. But I read about what some of our missionaries are going through, the challenges. And, and some of them have died on the mission field. And the persecution that they go and, and the fear like we got going on with, with Haiti. Uh, right now, we got Sarah and Kevin's down there. Uh, some of the uh, things that are going on with all the unrest, the political unrest in that country. They're willing to endure those things because they want to see somebody come to the Lord. And I think about it sometimes, and you know, I said if you have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. I've often asked the question, how, how big of a mustard seed do you need to move you off the couch? You know, think about it. Think about it. What are we willing to endure to ensure that our spouse, our children, our cousins, uncles, aunts, co-workers, neighbors get told about Jesus. Your first time doing it, maybe they don't grab you and hug you and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe the first time they actually turn away from you. But don't stop. Don't stop. Listen, I don't personally know anyone in this church that has been imprisoned or shipwrecked or stoned, I mean stoned with rocks. Uh, you got to be careful with it. <laughs> but I personally don't know of anyone that has suffered like that in, the, in their cause for Christ. 
You know what we're not willing to sacrifice or what we're not willing to suffer at times? We're not willing to suffer inconvenience. It's not a convenient time. It's not a convenient place. It's not the right opportunity. Uh, we have all these excuses, why not? I used to have a crew when I was uh, working out at, at the Cape and security forces. I had a group on one particular shift. They would work so hard at getting out of doing work. And I would say to them, I said, guys, if you would just go do it, it'd be done. It would be done. Yeah, there's, there's, there's times when you think, man, I don't know about talking to this person. They're not going to receive it well. How do you know? How do you know? We're not fortune tellers. We can't uh, prophesy about what a particular person, how the Lord's working in their life. We've seen some hard, hard people have their hearts just broken by the gospel and come to the Lord and turn out being, you know, a, a great soul winner. So what are you willing to suffer to spread the gospel? And I'm setting you up, by the way. I'm going to be up front with you. I'm setting you up because we're going through Way of the Master every Thursday night. We're going to have a uh, grow training on the 26th of March. What are you willing to suffer? Well, man, that's my Saturday. No, it's not your Saturday. It's God's Saturday. It's God's Monday. It's God's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It belongs to God, especially if you're a child of God. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm setting you up. Because that dream I had the other night, those people didn't come just because we opened the door. They came because you were inviting them. You were telling them about Jesus. You were the one that was concerned about their soul. And they could see it in your eyes. They could hear it in your voice. I love you. I don't want to see you go through this. What are we willing to, to, to suffer for Jesus? As we stand, Brother George, I'm Pastor D, and I pastor Truth Free Will Baptist Church at 5311 Barna Avenue, right here in Titusville, Florida. And I just want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in and listening to our sermon this morning, and uh, just to encourage you that if you were unable to be with us in person today, that uh, we would like for you to prayerfully consider being with us uh, in service next Sunday. Our services on Sundays are 9 o'clock. We have Sunday school. At 10 o'clock is our worship service. And then on our midweek services on Thursdays, we start at 6 o'clock with something we call Pizza with the Pastor. And that's uh, where moms and dads can come in with their young people and they can uh, have pizza together so you don't have to cook, you don't have to rush around. Uh, you have plenty of time to come in, have a, have a decent dinner, and then go on into our time of uh, worship and fellowship. And then uh, so at uh, 6.30, the adults, we retire into the sanctuary where we have our adult Bible study. Uh, we call that Foundations in Faith. So I just want to ask you to consider uh, being in church next week if you're un unable to attend in person or maybe you haven't been uh, because of all the recent uh, in events and challenges that we've had in this world. But uh, I want to encourage you, get up. Uh, if you have a home church, go there, be there, enjoy your fellowship with your brothers and sisters. If you don't, then uh, please prayerfully consider Truth Free Will Baptist Church uh, in your future. And so uh, I trust that this sermon was uh, an encouragement to you. If uh, by all means, if uh, you're looking for some spiritual guidance, you want to uh, develop that relationship with God and uh, you need some uh, help with that, you can always give us a call here at the church. Our phone number is 321-269-4033 and be more than happy to talk with you about your spiritual needs. And then uh, also, if this uh, ministry has been a blessing to you, we would like to ask you to consider to making an offering uh, to us uh, to help that ministry along. And then uh, you can go and visit our website at truthfwbc.com. And if you'll scroll to the bottom of that page, there's a, a button there where if you so choose, you can uh, donate to our ministry. So I thank you for that consideration. And then again, we're so glad that you were able to uh, tune in with us this morning. And I trust again that the sermon uh, touched your heart and that you were uh, encouraged as a result of it. Uh, trust that you have a good week. We'll be praying for you. God bless.